So um, what it, what happened was that Jamie had asked me whether I could come and talk about prostate cancer at Cancer International. And my response to that was, sure, I can give some people about information about Prostate Cancer International. Um, but what I am, what we actually do most of the time is that we help to provide people with either information or better still knowledge. And the way we try to do that is by getting them to ask questions. Um, and I mean, we do that when we hold conferences as much as when we do anything else. Uh, so, for example, the conference we had originally planned um, to do with you guys in, in April this year, and now we're thinking about, about whether we can do it in April next year, but even that I think is probably a goner, um, is that we only allow the speakers to, to give about a 10 to 15 minute presentation in an hour's presentation, and the other 45 minutes is about getting the audience to ask them questions or getting somebody like um, Jim um, or, or Ethan to ask questions, you know, when the audience takes a while to warm up. And I'm pretty good at answering those questions, but I'm a person who does one thing at a time. So I am not a good person to have running, um, you know, a video feed and switching slides and everything while I am actually thinking and talking. <laughs> um, in fact, I'm a very bad person at that because I tend to be very focused on one thing at a time. So what I was going to suggest was um, is it was whether Jim or Ethan, one of you would be actually be able to just sort of run the, the slides and I can say to you, okay, so if you click on the title of, I mean, in other words, if we bought up the prostate cancer infolink site and we showed them the homepage where they'd see there were lots of different um, uh, um, news pieces. Um, and then I can say to you, so if we click on that one, such and such a one, you know, you can see that it gives you more information about it. It gives you links to the original, you know, publication, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so we can sort of walk people through that. And we can probably do the same for the social network we run. Um, and there are a couple of other things that we can do with that as well. Does that make sense to you? Because I can get the audience to ask questions. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm really pretty good at that. And you probably know them as well. And I can deal with some of the, a lot of the things, Jim, that you brought up, but I'm not an expert on anything. Um, I, I have enough knowledge to be able to say to a particular patient, you might want to ask your doctor about this. Um, but the problem with talking to any group of prostate cancer patients is that they are all different and you cannot make generalizations and making generalizations is a mistake. Right. I, I, I think, um, Mike, your approach is fine. I think, um, you know, I've been using your, the new, new Cancer Information Network site for quite a long time. I'm very impressed. There's great information. They're very up to date. I, ha I haven't been as, I haven't been as rigorous over the last few months as I used to be. I, I've got a little distracted by other things, including coronavirus, coronavirus and, and certain presidential candidates. <laughs> oh, just saying, just saying that I think that would be great if you could just, uh, you know, show our group the resources that you have available, like that website, that would be great. Right, and so, uh, so yeah, other... and we'd be happy to move it along for you if you wish. It's, uh, it's not a right, problem. and so there are other things that are going on as well. Um, you know, we are trying to put together this collaborative advocacy group. Um, I am the chairman of the governance committee for that. Um, it's going to be a slow process and I don't want people to get too excited about it though, because it's, you know, we, we're going to have to work through establishing trust between all the different groups, um, deal with how the voting, you know, gets managed. There's a whole bunch of stuff and, you know, people should, temper their expectations um, for the first six months or so, because it may take us a while. You know, we, we haven't even got to the point where we can all agree to announce that it exists yet. <laughs> uh, so you're talking about some kind of umbrella group that would- Yes, what, what has happened is that um, a couple of the big drug companies has given money to the AUA Foundation to try to do this. Hmm. Um, and we have, we have a mission, we have a vision. Um, we have started to 
uh, work out how we vote. It has been agreed that there will be corporate members, that there will be non-corporate members, and that then there will be individual members. Um, but we are going to put limits on the number of individual members because otherwise it would just become a zoo. Um, we are very concerned about managing issues like transparency. In other words, how did we make decisions? Um, how did we, how, you know, how, how are we, what funding are we getting and how is that being used so that everybody is very comfortable because there have been three other attempts to form such a collaborative group in the, far, in the past. Mm. Uh, I, I, I put the first one together, which was um, the National Prostate Cancer Coalition that turned into, z into zero. Um, oh, that's what, turn, that's what zero is today? That, well, that's what it became. Really? Um, uh -huh. And the problem with that has always been that it now reflects the, pe the views largely of the people who work at zero as opposed to work, reflecting the views of the community as a whole. And that's not to criticize zero. It wasn't zero's fault that what happened happened. It was the fault of the other prostate cancer organizations who were also worried about, about, about each other stealing their ideas. You know, it was a typical case of what I refer to as male CEO stupidity. You know, where every male CEO thinks that he's the smartest person in the world. And without exception, he's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and so, 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 Mike, what, what, what is the, when you say advocacy, what exactly do you mean? Well, the, the, the real problem that we have is that there is no group that is big enough to truly influence Congress very much. In other words, Zero is very good at doing a few things, particularly, you know, ensuring that the uh, prostate cancer um, research project for, of the DOD gets refunded. Yeah, CRP. Yeah. Um, the Men's Health Network is very good at doing some things. Um, but we don't have the sort of clout as a set of organizations that the breast cancer people can put together. And until we get that sort of clout, there's only a few things we're going to be able to accomplish. Mm. So we need to get that clout. And the only way we're going to get it is by working together and focusing on some you know, certain very specific things that we can all agree on. Um, one of which is probably not screening. <laughs> and I say that because I am one of the people who thinks, quote, screening, unquote, is a very bad idea. I think selective testing is a wonderful idea. Um, I think anybody who wants to go and get tested for their risk for prostate cancer in any particular year is welcome to do so. Um, but I don't think that everybody needs to get screened on an annual basis. I think that's a really dumb idea because frankly, your PSA could go up, can go up from literally from day to day and then go down again four days later. And most people just don't understand that. You know, so I mean, it's it's random chance. Okay. What day did you go to the doctor? <laughs> well, uh, anyway, certainly, so, but, yeah. but that's something I can talk a little bit about. I mean, it's not a secret. It's it's not that we haven't told everybody we can't say anything about this yet. It's just that we haven't made any sort of formal announcement. And I'm happy to talk about that and say that we hope to be able to get get people to work more collaboratively and and speak with one voice. And that doesn't mean that zero wouldn't go on doing. Um, the, the the prostate cancer research program issue that we would we would in some ways be able to say to the different groups that looks like something you should lead the rest of us will support you you see what I'm saying sure rather than try and harvest everything in within one organization because that would be a really bad idea yeah so it, the idea is to be really collaborative with everybody sure well there's certainly a lot of areas where uh, prostate cancer treatments and and so forth really need to be improved there's no question about it um in terms of the scale of research funding um i think there's also like a significant where to, you know i think there's almost an order of magnitude difference between absolutely and, uh, and you know we we would our our view as a group at the moment 
um, is that that is an issue for organizations like the AUA, uh, um, yeah. the Prostate Cancer Foundation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if the rest of us can support them and we've all got the same message, you see what I'm saying? That, that's really important. The other thing that I mean, I am personally obsessed about is that something like 50% of all the men who get diagnosed with prostate cancer can and should be on active surveillance, at least for a significant period of time, if not forever. But there is no research or very little research yet into how we help those men to optimize the time that they can stay on manage, on active surveillance. Um, and there, I believe there are a lot of things that can be done in that area. And I'm, I'm actually, I'm working with some people to put together a big research grant um, to have a conference that deals with that topic is, you know, specifically, and to try and work out what the research priorities should be and what we can go after. And at the same time, build an international working group uh, to actually then start collaborating to, to do that research, as opposed to, you know, every university doing its own little thing. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the background that we, I can be telling people about. But at the same time, I mean, I really do want the audience to feel they can ask me questions about anything. So I take it you guys are familiar with the new urine test, which the FDA is fast tracking. Uh, which one of them? Well, it's, it's one of them, but it looks like the best one to me. Which um, one is that? Uh, it's the MI, MI Sentinel test. Ah, I've read about it, but I've not really gotten into it. Right. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it was 90% accurate in predicting the results of biopsies. Really? Yes. In now, different, uh, differentiating uh, between low and high risk yes. prostate cancer? Low, intermediate, and high risk. Wow. Okay. It was that good. Now, that was retrospective data. Um, they are hinting to me that they are going to do a, pros a prospective study so that they would be giving the test, um, but still doing the biopsies, you know, and then be able to compare sure. them. And, right. and, and then with the men who went on to have a radical prostatectomy, comparing those as well. Um, I have talked to them about can they do they think this can be used to monitor men on active surveillance and they say yes, they that that's definitely on their radar screen. Yeah, you know. So this again, I mean, there's a new imaging test where what you can do it's a it's a gallium um, sixty eight psma imaging test where what you actually do is you image the prostate after it's been taken out to see whether there is any sign of positive margins which is better than anything. They think it's better than, than, than the normal pathology test. Hmm. So, I mean, one of the things I keep trying to say to patients is there is so much going on now that being able to say to anybody, this would be better for you than X would be better than you for Y is, has become far more difficult. And yeah. the real question, if you're a patient today is, what are the best things I can do to provide me with input to that decision-making process. In other words, do I need a genetic test? Answer, if you have metastatic disease, certainly. If you have high-risk disease, near to certainly. Um, but, that, but they're slightly gen different genetic tests, obviously. If you've got metastatic disease, I want, I want to take a biopsy sample of the actual uh, tumor, not, not just of your blood. So there's a whole, I mean, and, and it, it's, it's become more and more and more complicated. And, and, and the issue that I try to get across to patients all the time is you have to, you have, there's, some, there's some basic information you have to learn. And one of the things I'm starting to look at is trying to put together a series of webinars, and I'm not there yet, um, that would go through the various different stages that's, that a patient could go through over time to say, okay, now that you've reached this stage, for example, um, you've, you've, had a, you've had a radical prostatectomy, your PSA went up, um, you've had uh, you know, focal, focused radiation to the site that could be seen, but it's still going up. Now, what are you gonna do? 
maybe you don't want to be going straight onto, a, onto ADT if your PSA is still only going up slowly. Maybe you need to make sure that um, you don't have oligometastatic disease, which should be treated differently than if you're being treated, if you have, you know, wholesale um, AD, ADT, because you may be able to still be curable. And I mean, these are just examples of, of, of the different situations that one can get into that we're beginning to be able to um, iron out. But A, most doctors don't have enough knowledge yet. It's not their fault. I mean, they don't have access to the tests. They don't have access to the whatever. You're not covered by the insurance for it. You know, you name it. Um, but at least if you know about it, you can ask about it. And if you've got enough money to be able to go to a really good prostate cancer center like the Cleveland Clinic, you know, you can probably get many of those things. I'm not sure how good they are at, 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 um, at the University of Cincinnati yet. I mean, I know they've got some good people there, but that's still not a, you know, a very big team that I'm aware of. So are we getting some clarity about what I think I can do for you? Sure. Well, I think so, sure. Yeah, there's so much to talk about. I think for us, it would be really good to get a broader perspective. I mean, we're living in our little, you know, our little cocoon here in Cincinnati. Right. And to get a broader understanding of what are the, what's going on in, you know, around the country in terms of the organizations, what the organizations might be able to accomplish right. for the prostate cancer community. Um, and, um, and also, again, the, the, these uh, websites that are extremely useful. So Ethan, um, what, which, what do you look at on a regular basis? On your website? No, not no. What do you go, look, go and look at? What do you use as oh. your regular learning tools? Well, you know, I get the prostate cancer news, and I'm subscribed to that. Um, I go a lot to Grand Browns in Urology, which is um, uh, YouTube-based lectures that are meant for the, uh, you know, for the pra practitioners, really. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of good information there. Um, you know, I get, I get half a dozen different feeds. And, Do you uh, look at Urology today? Mm, that one I don't think I do, actually. That's, That's the AU... That's the AUA's website, right? No, that no, that's that's a separate site. Um, that oh. um, it is run by some people no, in I California, that one. and um, basically they provide information for everybody in different forms. Mm. Um, I mean, they focus largely on the urologist, but um, they yeah. do inter they will they do lots and lots of interviews of speakers at meetings. Okay. Um, they have opinion leader presentations, but they also scan all the literature um, so that, you know, if, if something hot and new comes up, you know, they'll, they'll pick it up yeah. usually within 48 hours um, and you'll have a link to the, to the relevant, you know, paper on, or at least the abstract available. Sure, sure. Um, so one of the things I might be able to do is sort of say, here are the things that I use as feeds. You know, so that, you know, so you've got some idea what's available out there. Now, yes, certainly. And, and that goes to the extent that, I mean, I am a member of the AUA. I am a member of ASCO. Um, and so I also get all that material as well. I don't expect the average patient to go to those things. Um, but, you know, it, 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 at least you, 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 if you want to, it's possible to belong to those things. I mean, it doesn't cost me that much a year to be an affiliate member of the AUA. You only need to find find somebody who you know, who will sponsor you. And I mean, I think I think I pay three hundred bucks a year or something. You know, and I mean, it, it gives me an enormous amount of information, obviously. And mm. I and I, I you know I, I can then sign up to you know see all the abstracts at the AUA annual meetings or and go to the meeting and blah 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 blah. Again, as I say, I'm not saying everybody should want to do that. Um, one of the things that I am hoping in time we will persuade this coalition to do is to actually fund um, a, a patient, what I would describe as a, as, as a set of a sort of patient cohort, you know, to go to the AUA and the ASCO annual meetings each year um, and literally 
be able to report what they are hearing at the meeting from their perspective, you know, using Twitter and whatever else they want to use. I mean, if we had 15 patients doing that, you know, that would be an enormous amount of information coming out of that meeting as seen by the patient. But you do have to have experience to be able to do that because otherwise the meeting just overwhelms you. You know, you've got to, you've got to learn how to, how to navigate meetings like that. Um, and I mean, I've been doing, I've been reading scientific literature and going to meetings for 50 years. So I'm fairly good at it, but it, it does take a little bit of time to learn to do. Um, the, uh, the, AU, the, the PCF has a patient um, advisory board and, and, and other patient programs that they're involved with. And I always tell patients, reach out to them, ask them if there's something you can do to help them. Mm. Um, do you know, do you know John Fortin yet? Yes. Okay. So I've been working very closely with John from the moment I first met him um, mm. on a whole bunch of different stuff, uh, just as I do with Tony Crispino, who's the, uh, the, the patient advocate on SWOG, Southwest Oncology Group. Um, and Tony is now an author on nearly every set of guidelines that comes out of the AUA and ASCO because he, he, they, they, they've, they look to him as a patient representative. Um, and I mean, I, I was paid Tony's mentor, you know, for quite a long time, uh, mm. just after he, he first got treated. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, my, my biggest message for people is, is always ask, ask good questions. Um, do homework. You have to keep doing homework because things change. I mean, so much. I mean, I've been doing this now for thirty years in prostate cancer alone, and I mean, I helped to launch Ulexin. I I helped to launch Prostate Cancer Awareness Week. I did not realize at the time that test PSA testing of everybody was not necessarily a good idea. Um, it was Tom Stamey who told me that. <laughs> Um, and even he didn't know at the time, but then I, then I met Jerry Chodak and Jerry did. <laughs> hmm. Um, okay. and, and, well, you know, as a consequence, I've got an enormous amount of accumulated knowledge that I can pull on to be able to help to answer questions for patients okay. as to, as to well, why certain yeah. things happen or don't happen. Well, fair enough. You know, we can leave it at that because I think we now have a sort of a framework. Right. Uh, and, but there are uh, certain certain things on that website that you definitely want people to see. Not really. I mean, the important thing for people is is I mean, it's it's it, is the news service that is by far the most important thing. Everything else, by comparison, is useful. Um, the the one thing I try not to do on that website is I try not to get into detailed discussions with individual patients. I try to get those patients to go to my um, to our um, social network where, where we can have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them and other people will also chip in. Because part of the most important thing I, we try to do is to get people to what I would describe as prostate cancer 101 level. In other words, if you don't understand about these things, you haven't really started to learn yet. So you, you have to understand how to classify prostate cancer into very low, low, you know, low intermediate, high intermediate, high and very high risk, and, and know that you fall into one of those groups. You have to understand that getting genetically tested is only useful under certain circumstances because a very small number of patients are actually usefully treated with some of the drugs that currently get the most excitement. In other words, PARP inhibitors only work for a small number of people. CAR-T therapy hardly works for anybody, but it does work for some. Um, but we're not very good yet at working out who. Um, you know, by comparison, the average patient, you know, who has average, uh, you know, metastatic prostate cancer is still going to get treated the same way as he was 15 years ago unless he wants to go into a clinical trial. Okay. Yes, it's, uh, it's true. There's very, very slow progress. Um, well, you say very slow, but you've got, if you take my perspective from 1979, which was when I first got involved, sorry, 1989, when I first got involved till 2003, there was zero. 
Really? There was, there was, there was one new antiandrogen, which was Kazadex. <laughs> mm. That's what happened over that, you know, 10 year period. So and then, Abbott, and then, Abbott, then we got tax, tax a tier, and then the floodgates opened. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, apparently, you know, advocacy works, uh, and funding works. It does. Um, it's unfortunate that I would say ninety percent of the funding goes for, you know, it's, it improves the, the the database, right, the knowledge base, but getting a you know a use, useful druggable. Um, compounds really into into drugs into treatment it takes forever so let and me let me give you a reverse example of that i mean you're right but i am also on the board of the international myeloma foundation when i joined that board there hadn't been a new drug for the treatment of myeloma in 40 years wow the only yeah. drug that was available um was um i can't even remember what the hell it was now um Anyway, it was the only one that was available. Um, and they had only just discovered that thalidomide might be a good drug to treat prostate cancer. It still had to go through phase three trials. It took 10 years to get to lenalidomide, the next major drug after thalidomide. There are now 140 different drugs in clinical trials from multiple myeloma that, that have you know, some hope of becoming useful. Right. We haven't well, got there yet in prostate cancer. The, 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 the door is still is ajar. We've started to find different ways to treat the disease in the sense that POP inhibitors are different, you know, to ADT or to, or to classic chemotherapy. Um, but we're really only at the beginning of that evolution. Uh, yeah. Well, that's, you know, I... Uh... I know that the the rate at which progress can be made is picked up because of uh, computer modeling of proteins, uh, um, CRISPR, all these technologies that are making it so much easier to um, manipulate the, the cellular biology, and that's and that's great, you know. So uh, yeah, but to me, the biggest advance has actually come in in the diagnostic and prognostic tools. Um, we have become so much better at being able to say to a patient, you are low risk. You don't need to do X or Y. You know, we can just monitor you. You are really low risk. Now you're gonna have anxiety and we have to work out how to manage that anxiety. But actually that's not hard to do. You know, I mean, I've actually been trying to put together um, a, a randomized clinical trial where you took men on active surveillance and you randomized them to having access to a 1-800 number or not. If you didn't get the 1-800 number, you, you simply got the usual booklet that said, this is what you need to do, right? But the 1-800 number would actually take you to a nurse who had experience with prostate cancer who could pull up your medical record in front of you. So that when you rang and said, my PSA went up by 0.001, I'm scared to death. She can say, oh, yes, it did that three months ago again, didn't it? And then it went down again. <laughs> yeah. In other words, you know, let's, let's just, let's look at the reality of this as opposed to the panic. <laughs> because well, I, I swear to God, I, I think if we did that and you, we, we showed that people had access to a service like that, um, it wouldn't be that expensive and it would be really, really easy to manage their, help them to manage their anxiety until they had, had learned to cope with it themselves. Cause it's yeah. within the first two years that most people will go off active, active surveillance for no good reason other than their anxiety. Sure. Well, the same thing could be said for people who, who have, who go on focal therapy. Yep. What is it? What is it? What is folk? What is follow up for focal therapy? That's right. It's, it's really like, it's, I don't want to say it's insane, but it's, it's well, talk about I mean, anxiety provoking. You know? part, of, part of the problem is that you have to understand that when you, when you elect to have focal therapy, um, there are no guarantees. Well, certainly not. Um, I mean, it's, in some ways, it's worse than active surveillance, because at least if you're, you're on active surveillance, you know that your PSA 
could start to rise and you could, you could progress at any time. Whereas once you've had focal therapy, you want to believe that you've been cured. You know, because your hope is that it's eliminated the whatever it was, one, you know, sure. five millimeters of, of, of Gleason 6 prostate cancer that's gone. Sure. The problem is it can't tell you that you had another focus somewhere else in Gleason 7. Well, absolutely. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's all these issues. So right. um, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I completely agree with you. Uh, in terms of diagnostic, I know that around here, you know, we, we've talked to the doctors about these biomarkers and they're very reluctant to use them because they don't know what to do with them. Well, that, that's part of this. You see, this is the other thing that I say to people. We have, we, we have all these new tests now, but knowing how to use them is the key. Um, people like Eric Klein up at the Cleveland Clinic have got pretty good at using these tests now. Yeah. The average doctor doesn't know how to use them well. Right. And yeah, I have to, yes. It's like think... it's it's like the average surgeon. Um, the last thing I want to do is have my prostate taken out by an average surgeon. I want the best fucking prostate cancer surgeon in the world. <laughs> and there was a friend, good friend of mine called Arnon Krongrad, who was the first person to start regularly doing laparoscopic radical prostatectomies in America. And Arnon has always said to me, any fool can take a prostate out. Any, any decent surgeon can become really good at taking prostates out. The best surgeons have no clue whether they are going to be able to successfully take a prostate out until they have started the operation because they know that the next surgeon, who, the next patient who walks into their operating room will have something really weird that they've never seen before. <laughs> and that's how they have to approach the operation. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we actually had uh, Dr. McLaughlin from uh, University of Michigan who talked to us about vessel sparing radiotherapy and uh, pointed out how, you know, how the, the uh, morphology or the, uh, um, the layout there, the prostate and the nerve bundles can be so different from patient to patient and yep. so forth. Well, and quite, so, so, can, so, so can the structural anatomy of the bone, bone structure surrounding it. You know, I mean, if you've got a narrow pelvis, it's a very different operation for the surgeon than if you're you, you're the you're, you're a male with the equivalent of childbearing hips. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, you're yeah. operating in a tighter space. Um, you know, and in, it, it, I mean, I'm not saying it's radically different, but it is different. You don't well, have. Well, uh, I I think what I'm what I'm hearing from you, Mike, is that you can answer a lot of questions. And maybe we should just leave it more open than that. And uh, like you say, leave more time for Q and A. Well, that's I what I'd like to do because I think, I think that that's the greatest service that I can provide for you guys. Yeah. I think that's I mean, good. You know, we've, we've been doing that with more and more people and, and it seems like it turns out well. So well, I, I think that'll work. The, the thing I really love about it is that it, it, it it involves the audience and then they feel that they're being listened to. And, you know, often somebody will ask a question that another person wanted to ask, but felt uncomfortable about asking it. So you're answering both of their questions at the same time, but only one of them actually knows, so to speak. Yes, that's fine. That's, that's good. And, and we really have a pretty good group for that. Now this COVID thing where we're doing everything, uh, virtually has made a lot of difference on who shows up. Sure. But if we get our normal crew in there, we, we have a lot of good people that can ask good questions. So, yeah. So I do have a couple of questions for you. Um, what, what's the, what is the general size of the group on, now that you're doing it virtually? Oh, I don't know. What are we running? So I'd say 25, something like that. Okay. Uh, That's a decent number. Yeah, um, that's and, a good night. Yeah, and and do they cross the entire spectrum from the newly diagnosed to the metastatic castrate resistant? Uh, hmm. it's sometimes uh, you know recently you know there for a long time we weren't able to get any new people, and in the last month month and a half I think we've had a dozen or a half dozen or two maybe ten or twelve people show up so maybe things are changing around and. If we get some of these people coming back in, I'll get on them and see if they get, some, then we'd have a pretty good spectrum of who's coming. 
So I had sent to Jamie um, a, a list of the sites that we operate um, that if you were able to bring those up on the screen at, at a particular time, I can talk about those. Yeah, no problem. Um, you just, we'll just, I'll just plan on having those buffered here. And right. whenever you Is there say, anything or, else you really need from me? I mean, you know, I mean, I'm happy to provide what I can. I'm a, just trying a to bio. Keep, it's as simple as a, a bio. Yes. I, will I will send you a bio later this evening. No problem. How about a picture? Um, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I haven't got a recent picture, but I'll send you a picture. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. When, when the hair's okay. a little longer and I can, I can, I, it's really, you know, down below my shoulders, I'll, I'll, I'll get a new tip picture taken. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. send us the one when you look, what you look like when you're 25. That'll be good. I think I've got one when I, when I, I think I've done a decent one that I looked like when I was about 50. I've got a suit and tie on, but I can send you that one. Okay. Well, I won't have a suit and tie on for this. <laughs> okay. Uh, guys, I'm going to have to get off in a minute. Uh, is there anything you need from me in particular? No, Jim? I'm fine. So okay. as long as I've got the Zoom thing and I, you know, I, and I can get into it, I will be there. That's that's no problem. Okay. Um, the only other thing, you know, I mean, if you think of anything else you want from me, please don't hesitate to ask. My my goal is to be as cooperative as I can. Great. Terrific. We really appreciate it, Mike. Okay. No us problem. A, especially Look giving us a broader, a broader perspective on the prostate cancer world. That would be great. <laughs> that's that's the goal when I can manage it. Okay. Uh, if you're if you're if you're going to watch the, the debate tonight, take two aspirins so that you don't get too stressed. <laughs> <laughs> as long as Either we don't bring that up, yeah. as long as we keep yes. politics out of the meetings, I think we'll be all right. <laughs> I, I I have no need, I think, to be bringing that into the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. So let's okay. say uh, six forty-five yep. on. Tuesday night, we'll try to get this fired up again. I'll be sending you another link uh, to, for you to click on. Okay, cool. Okay, thanks, thanks guys. All righty. Bye-bye. Thanks again. Bye. No problem. Bye-bye.